Welcome to the Attic Monologues, Episode 5, In the Walls. The ghost waits. It waits like a clock waits out the day, like the sun waits out the years. Slowly, passively, with no notion of time passing at all. The world might move, the earth might shake, but the ghost, as always, waits. It doesn't think itself a ghost, doesn't know that word, that concept, doesn't know the boundaries between life and death, metaphor and reality. It can't even consider itself in real terms, let alone the world. It doesn't remember anything before the waiting before the world became a single room, a single thought, a single task. The room the ghost waits in is nothing. There's a floor, a blanket of beige, washed-out carpet that is neither rough nor soft. There are walls, plastered with white wallpaper that is old enough to begin peeling, but new enough not to be black with mould. The ghost has stared at those walls so long it knows every pockmark, every blemish by heart. There is a ceiling, too, dense above its head. A ceiling supposed to be so low? It can't remember, but it feels the pressure, the closeness all the same, bearing down on it. This is the only place the ghost remembers. The only place that matters, really. The ghost has been here for what feels like forever. It isn't sure what that word means, but it sounds right. Long and fuzzy at the edges, like a yawn, like the effort of imagining infinity. And in some ways, the ghost is right. Without reference to anything else, does not the thing before its eyes become infinite? The world is a single room of sickly white walls and shadow, and will continue to be so, forever. It's inevitable that boredom creeps in, that the ghost wouldn't know to call the itch under its skin by that name. It has memorised the world by sight, every crack and imperfection, when suddenly the sensation of touch comes to its mind. It feels its feet on the ground, the dusty carpet curled between its toes, It feels the air in the room, neither hot nor cold, settling around its limbs. Decides to explore the world. The ghost wanders, fifteen paces from wall to wall, sixteen paces diagonally. It can brush its fingers along the rough paint of the ceiling and the whirls in the wood of the floorboards. Are those dark, smudged marks worked into the wood a simple part of the tree that they used to be? Or do they yawn like open, hungry mouths, because that's exactly what they are? The ghost, of course, doesn't wonder this. It does not look at floorboard and think tree. This is simply what floors are made of, fully formed when the world began. It is for us to wonder how this room came into being. When was it built? By who? Is it part of a house or a block of flats? Why has no one entered it since the ghost found itself there? How long has the ghost been there? Is it even a ghost at all? Or a metaphor I've used to make you, the listener, feel? If I told you there is a person trapped inside a room who feels lonely... Would you understand the utter hollowness of that feeling? There's something almost there inside the ghost, beneath the surface, behind the eyes, in the space between blinking and breathing. Does it even need to breathe? Maybe it really is dead and has no need at all. Or has reflex kept its lungs heaving even now, after the end? Who knows? Well, I do. 
but I'm just here to tell you a good story. Let's return to the ghost, who waits in a room that, for all intents and purposes, could exist in a void. The ghost has wandered for forever. Nothing changes, nothing moves, except it. It's at this point that the ghost notices the window. A large rectangle of wood framing and glass set into one wall of the room. Was there a window there before? There has always been light here, falling across the floor just so. Is this where it came from, all this time? It moves closer, shaking. There is a terror building in its bones, unnameable, electric. It doesn't know what to do with a world beyond these four walls. A world that isn't made of pale, peeling paper and paint, that doesn't end. Beyond the glass, the world stretches. There is a horizon so far, so distant, it shrinks the world that touches it. There are colours, green and brown and grey, grey, grey. A ceiling of smoky clouds and drab light washing out the world below. Even so, it is bright like the glare of headlights, like the sun is out in full fury. The ghost blinks, blinks, tries to make sense of all these shapes, these colours, this space. The clouds part for just a second. Behind them is another ceiling, one of glaring blue. It doesn't feel like the other ceilings the ghost has encountered. It feels big wide. It stares back at the ghost, hungry, expectant, infinite. Something new grows inside the ghost, slowly, like the roots of a tree, like the fester of rot. It doesn't have a name for this feeling, isn't sure it has ever felt anything else at all, now that it's drowning beneath it. But it's there, like fingers curling around its lungs to squeeze, like a hand wrapping around its throat, splaying across its mouth, like its skin contracting, tightening around flesh. It is suffocating, and if it still needed to breathe, it would gasp. Instead, it feels the slow, deliberate weight of a boot stepping onto its chest. It sees the walls growing taller, leaning in to watch as the world begins to spin. There is too much outside the window. The ghost has no words for any of it, but it knows that. It is wrong for there to be so much space, so much air. It is wrong for the world to carry on beyond 16 paces. And yes, it does. And now those sixteen paces seem so small. The sky in this room is too close to the ground. The walls cling to it. They are the boot on its chest and the hand at its throat. Now that the world is infinite, the world is too small. The ghost fears that empty open sky, the yawn of its cerulean mouth. But it fears this rotting, empty tomb more. It fears vanishing like a puff of winter breath, unknown, unmarked. There is a hollow it doesn't know to call loneliness that opens a second gaping mouth inside its chest. It will consume the ghost's heart, chew up its stomach, its lungs, until there is more chasm than ghost. It already has so little inside. How much has it lost to get here? It doesn't remember before. But there is the emptiness of where things should be. Memories, perhaps, of a life under that blue-grey sky. Connections, now cut, that filled up the hollowness of its heart. And the ghost discovers want. It wants to live. It wants to breathe. It wants to walk and walk and fall off the edge of the earth and keep walking turns and the window is gone.
The world is four white pockmarked walls. The ghost runs to where the window was, its hands pressed desperately against the brick as if it might give. But there's no sign of the infinite world, no sign of the glass and wood. Was it ever there? Did it dream and escape? Did a memory, a stray shred caught somewhere in the back of its mind, conjure the world like a dream? It doesn't matter, really. The ghost cannot stay here. Its fingers curl against the wall. Its nails catch against it. Here, it stops. A single curl of alabaster wallpaper peeling away from the wall like the slow release of a spring, just below eye level, itching to be stripped away. The ghost feels that want again, turned to fire, turned to need. It needs to escape, like the world needs to turn and the living need to breathe. It has no concept of what makes a building, of brick and cement and insulation foam. It sees a peak of not white behind that curl, and since the walls of the world are nothing else, this must be a second window to the sky. The walls of the world, it turns out, crumble easily. The sound of paper tearing away from brick is thunder across an empty, dry plain. No rain, no lightning, just that pressure, as if the air is alive. Just the low, heavy hang of bruises rippling across sky and the bellow of the world tearing in two. The paper comes away entirely. A single strip, chalk white on both sides, cradled in the ghost's hands. Who could believe that the world was made of something so tangible, of something so breakable? With that first strip, Something breaks, inside the ghost or inside the world, it cannot be sure, but suddenly there is frenzy. Strip after strip after strip, it tears at the wall, claws at paper, and then it brick until its fingers are bloody. Except, the ghost stops as it sees the bloom of red on the grain bricks beneath the wallpaper. Its fingers hover inches away, scared to touch this sudden explosion of colour, unsure of what it is supposed to mean. It doesn't know that fingers are supposed to bleed, because its fingers are whole and unharmed. It doesn't know that walls aren't supposed to bleed, because it can see with its own two eyes that this scarlet is dripping, seeping from a crack between brick and cement. What would you do if you found the walls of your home bleeding? Would you run? Would you pretend not to see it? Hope your mind was simply playing tricks or it would go away? Would you tear into it to find the source? For surely, you would reason, there is a source that isn't the wall. A body, perhaps, for you to discover dramatically and end up on the front page of the news. The ghost looks at the blood on the wall and sees only something new. There's no fear of the things that lurk in the shadows. It hasn't learnt that new and good are very rarely synonymous. But it is desperate, and it is naive, so we must excuse its decisions as it presses its fingers against the crimson smear on the wall and pushes. The wall gives way. Not in the way of bricks and plaster crumbling. It gives way softly, wetly, folding around the hands the ghost pushes into the wall. The bricks, are they bricks? Shift and squirm, hugging at the ghost's fingers. They feel smooth and warm, hot even. And when the ghost wraps its fingers around an edge and pulls, a curl of skin and flesh comes away. It's the same colour as the wallpaper, if a little bloody. Limper, wetter, it clings to the ghost's hand as it stares. The wall is bleeding more profusely now, 
blood bubbles up at the place where the ghost has torn its body away in chunks, spills over onto the snowy wallpaper like tears. The ghost's hands drip. The air in the room is gone. Something hot and acid rises up inside the ghost. The echo of horror, perhaps. Some muscle memory of a reaction that knows that this... This is wrong. But it has come too far to stop now. And so it drops the curl of skin to the ground and digs back in. I will not continue to describe such an awful thing. We can only excuse the actions of a ghost so far. And what did that room ever do to it to deserve such a gruesome fate? It kept the ghost safe from a world that is yawning and aching and ravenous, that would have chewed it up and spat it out without a second thought. Let us just say that what the ghost found on the other side of the wall was not an open, blue sky. That when you strip away enough layers of skin, the only things left to find are bone and heart and blood. And there, at the centre of it all, the ghost discovers everything it had lost. A fountain of truths and lies, hopes and regrets, joy and despair. A life in all its colour. If you could choose to lose everything, start again with a fresh blank slate, would you? I wouldn't. I can imagine nothing worse. But the ghost, well... The ghost is not me. A looks on that which made it person, not ghost. And it turns away. Everything falls away as the ghost curls in on itself. In a corner of the room that was once the world, it shivers and breathes and lets everything outside go. The ghost forgets. Forgets the life, forgets the blood and flesh of the walls, forgets the glimpse of sky in the wide, wide window. It lets the world shrink to fifteen paces, sixteen diagonally. Beside it, the walls of the world heal. The blood evaporates and the skin scabs over and flakes until it is a blank white wall, pockmarked and peeling. The ghost uncurls looks around the room, small and unassuming. It feels as if it has been here forever, though it isn't sure what that word means. It sounds right, though, long and fuzzy at the edges, like a yawn. The ghost waits. That is all it has left to do. Well, I don't know why I thought that was a good one to read today. What was it Bella said? A bit too close to home? Yeah. Just a bit. Maybe it's the universe atting me. Hey you! Go outside and touch some grass! Am I... Am I haunting the flat? God, I am. It's not like I'm trying to be pathetic. This week is just one of those weeks when the world is too much, too heavy. It's probably just the weather. Rain should be illegal if it isn't cold outside. Otherwise, it's just suffocating. <sighs> At least the walls aren't bleeding. I don't think. I hope not. I would probably keep digging, if I'm honest. I'm definitely that person who gets killed in the first five minutes of the horror movie because they went to investigate the spooky noise. Anyway. But... Her... Hi, little fella. 
How'd you get in here? Stupid question, Nix. Obviously, it flew in through the window, which you left open. Whilst you left the heating on, what would Mum say? Can't exactly close the window with you still in here, though, can I? Unless you'd like to come live with me? I'll warn you, I'm a terrible roommate. I seem to have a talent for scaring people off like I've shouted boo at a flock of birds. Would that scare you away, Mix Raven? Are you even a raven? A blackbird? Look, a crow? Come to stand in whilst mine's flown the nest? I don't know anything about birds. Are you one of those ones that never forgets anything? If I let you stay inside this one time, are you going to keep coming back? Not that I mind that, if I'm honest. Would be nice to have some company. So you're welcome. The rent is outright theft, and I think we have a mouse problem, but that's probably a perk for you, right? Oh, hang on. Here. Almonds. Birds eat almonds, right? I'll just... And if you eat them, I'll know. And if you keel over, I'll get you to a vet ASAP, I guess. Just please don't do that. I'm pretty sure you eat almonds. 80% sure, maybe. At least you don't seem to be running away screaming. I don't know what's happening. I know she... I know none of them are ignoring me. Not on purpose, at least. It's not their fault I'm like a, like a flower that shrivels up without the sun, without attention. They give me what they want, what they can, and that's more than enough. It's just everyone being busy all at once. It sucks. Lola's doing a trial shift somewhere. Seth is studying. I haven't heard from Bella since she left, but she's fine. She's always terrible at answering her phone anyway. But she wouldn't even tell me what was up before she left. But it's fine. I should be busy too, anyway. I got a role on Twelfth Night for December. Marketing manager. I know, right? You're so proud of me. Why, thank you, Mixed Bird. I worked very hard for this role. So there's that to be doing. Or I could read another monologue. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Mixed Bird? A performance just for you. Or I could do my degree. God, I'd love to be able to focus on my degree. But every time I try to sit down and work, it's like like a rubber band wrapped around my brain. And my instincts pull further away the more I try to sit down and work until I snap. It's like physically painful. That's not really normal, is it? Wow, look at me, talking to birds. What has the world come to? Better than just haunting my room, I guess. I've had more lines in this scene than the ghost had in it, so I'm already winning. In fact, I've had the only lines in this scene because I'm talking to a freaking bird. Would you like to speak, Mixed Bird? Or is the world much easier when you don't have to worry about words? You'd probably be telling me to stop moping if you could speak. That's what Bella would say. She'd drag me out of bed and we'd go for a walk in the park. Even if it was raining so hard, we were shivering and dripping in seconds. We'd take some almonds and feed the birds. And maybe we'd get the worst colds of our lives, but... Sorry. I must be terrible company. I myself am best when least in company. That's some Shakespeare for you, Mixbird. Twelfth Night.
If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, so fighting the appetite may sicken and so die. <sighs> I myself am definitely not best when least in company. I don't know what to do with myself when I'm alone. I just sink. Being an introvert must be such a peaceful existence. Anyway, I... Nix, are you in here? Who are you talking to? Is Bella back? No, she's not back. I'm just talking to... Am I really going to tell him I was talking to a bird? I was just talking to myself. So the... The bird on the countertop has nothing to do with it? Bird? What, what bird? Oh, that bird. No, Sam, I have no idea how it got in here. Why, Mick's bird, however did you get in here? Were you spying on me, talking to myself? Okay. Listen, if Bella comes back and finds out I replaced her with a bird, she'll be ever so upset. You could replace her with other humans. Or a trip to the library. Right. Hang on. Sam, you're a human. Want to watch Much Ado About Nothing with me? Which version? The one with Catherine Tate and David Tennant, obviously. I'm... good, actually. Oh. Why? I've lived with you for a month, and we've already watched it twice. The point? Even you must be bored of it by now. Impossible. If I don't watch it at least 12 times a year, I've failed as a human being. And how many times have you watched it this year? 26. Right. You need to get out more. Want to go to the library instead? I'm meeting a couple other English students there, but I'm sure you'd know a couple of them. Uh, Iman, she does dual honours with drama. I know her, yeah. Evie, leave the house for the first time in over a week and come to the library with me, or you can clean the kitchen. I grab my coat. Maybe kick the bird out first? I'm not cleaning shit off the counter if we get back and it's made a mess. Mixed bird is very polite and civilised and would never do anything of the sort. Would you, Mixed bird? No. I thought not. Okay, fine. I can't believe you're forcing this bird out onto the streets. You have no heart. I have heart? I haven't tried to strangle you or Bella in your sleep yet. I'd say that takes heart. Remind me to sleep with a knife beneath my pillow? You already do that. When did you have the chance to look beneath my pillow? Bella told me. Where did she have a chance to look beneath my pillow? I don't know, last time you two hooked up? <laughs> we, we, we didn't. We, we haven't. Shut up, Sam. I'll grab my laptop. Meet you by the door in five. And Nix, get rid of the bird. I'm very sorry to leave you homeless, Mix Bird. You're welcome back any time you like. I wish you happy hunting, whether it be for all the mice you could eat or a new house to rest in. Thank you for listening to The Attic Monologues. Today's episode was written and produced by Morgan Greensmith. It was directed and script edited by Ellen Cluhessi. The sound design was by Anna Leclerc, and the theme tune was composed by Wilkie Morrison. In this episode, you had the voices of... Atlas Morgan as Nix Ryland. Kit Lovick as Sam Harris. The logo was designed by Ailey Lang. The social media is run by Soren Briarwood. Find us on Twitter at Attic Monologues, and on Tumblr, Instagram and Facebook at The Attic Monologues. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sending us some love through our Ko-fi. You can find us at www.co-fi.com slash theatticmonologues. Or maybe just leave a rating and review. Or you could even tell a friend you think might enjoy oblivious romantics, creeping fantasy elements and existential crises to listen. Any comments or questions, shoot us a message over our socials or email us at theatticmonologues at gmail.com. Again, from all of our team, thank you so much for listening. Episode 6, Caramel and Clove, will be out on Wednesday, August 25th. See you then!